Hey, before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you know that my candle shop, Knox and Vesta, has just recently released three new scents, The Isles, Persephone, and Koi. The Isles smells like if you were to visually see a river flowing through a beautiful green forest with lots of moss and trees. Persephone smells like a lot of dark fruit and pomegranate. It's really kind of a unique scent. And Koi, of course, is called Koi because it's honeysuckle playing Koi. It's a honeysuckle candle that I think just has a little bit of a twist that makes it a little more fun. Make sure to check it out at noxvesta.com, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com. Imagine you're in your college years or your mid twenties. I'm sure many of you had or are still planning to enjoy parties, outdoor life, hanging out with friends, maybe even going to the bar for the first time, all that good stuff. Perhaps you even had some mental health struggles and we're trying to help you get back on your feet. And that's all relatively normal, right? Well, now imagine that someone close to you decided they didn't approve of your choices and petitioned a court to take over your entire life. Now, not only is the partying taken away, but so are your financial and medical rights. Everything you do is now monitored and you have little to no control left whatsoever. This is the dark side of conservatorships. And while this exact scenario may be rare, the system of conservatorship itself is horribly broken and the victims are all too often silenced. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about conservatorships. I'm sure that many of you are somewhat aware that Britney Spears' conservatorship has finally ended and it sheds some light on how conservatorships can be controlling and abusive. Now, my plan and how I'm hoping my approach to this topic will be taken is from the angle of how can we ensure that this doesn't happen again? Why exactly was Britney Spears' conservatorship so strict with no end in sight? Is this typical to how things work? And what does this situation mean for other Americans that find themselves in conservatorships? While many people are aware that conservatorships may allow conservators to have financial control over the assets or medical decisions of an elderly person, in Britney's case, the decisions were made for her that have been seriously questioned by the public and experts alike. In one example, the decision by her conservators to leave her IUD in has been called a clear reproductive justice violation. And an IUD is a form of birth control that goes inside the uterus. At a recent court hearing, Brittany said she wanted to get rid of this IUD and to have another baby, but quote, this so-called team won't let me go to the doctor to take it out because they don't want me to have any more children. Making medical decisions for a conservatee may be a common aspect of a conservatorship, but Brittany's conservatorship itself is far from the standard. And we'll talk more on that in a moment. Multiple experts have weighed in on this, voicing their concerns. Deborah Mullen, a professor of counseling psychology at Texas Women's University and certified sexual educator said she was worried about the potential harm in this case, particularly around reproductive coercion. Rachel Johnson Farias, executive director of the Center on Reproductive Rights and Justice at Berkeley Law School said the following, Brittany's IUD can be removed, but the fact that she is not allowed to choose when that happens in combination with the amount of time that the IUD has already been in place, 13 years, means that Spears has been stripped of making reproductive choices and the longer it persists, the more her case looks like forced sterilization. Sonia Goshavila, the California state senior organizer at Unite for Reproductive and Gender Equality also referred to this as an explicit form of reproductive coercion. Sonia said she was disgusted, but unsurprised by Brittany's case. And she too calls it forced birth control and sterilization. Reproductive justice and rights, as these experts explained, maintain the idea that everyone should have the right to family and the right to bodily autonomy. After all, you can't be forced to be an organ donor. What you do with your own reproductive organs should be your decision. These are truly basic human rights that we've been fighting for, for decades now. Vogue explained in the article, the history of coercion dressed up as care is a long one that stripped away reproductive freedom in the name of care or conservatorship is anything but new. Snipping, typing, and removing the fallopian tubes of black women without their consent after childbirth was so common in Mississippi throughout the 1920s and 30s that it earned its own nickname, the Mississippi appendectomy. And in case you're wondering, yes, the state government allowed this and even helped fund it. Before we continue, I just want to insert a brief trigger warning for sexual assault. Please skip the next couple minutes if you're gonna find this too upsetting to listen to. Now, one of the examples that Rachel Johnson Farias told the San Diego Union Tribune was a 1920s case in which a young woman named Carrie Buck had been forcibly sterilized. Her foster parents' nephew had forced himself on Carrie and she became pregnant. The foster family, apparently to hide their shame, had Carrie admitted into a mental institution, then sterilized under a law rooted in eugenics. 
It's no surprise that these kinds of laws would be rooted in eugenics, but it is infuriating that this kind of reproduction coercion still exists today, just in different forms. Of course, reproductive rights should be their own episode, but I do wanna focus on why conservatorships can strip people of rights such as these and more. So how has this been allowed in the first place? Well, let's get into what conservatorships are and when they happen. Investopedia defines conservatorship as a legal status to which a court appoints a person to manage the financial or personal affairs of a minor or incapacitated person. There are different kinds of conservatorships. Some are for individuals who may have physical or intellectual disabilities. In other cases, adults with Alzheimer's or dementia may also become conservatees. Mental capacity has to be well-documented in these cases. And while guardianship manages personal and day-to-day decisions, it usually refers to a guardian over a minor, Conservatorship has more financial control and often refers to an incompetent or incapacitated adult. Other sources say that these terms are often used interchangeably, but guardianship typically refers to children and conservatorship typically refers to adults that can't take care of themselves. At times, a partner, a fellow family member, or adult child will fill this role for conservatee as they would hopefully have the conservatee's best interest in mind, but professional conservators can be court appointed to do this too. However, even if a judge does grant a conservatorship to someone, a conservatee is not supposed to lose all their rights. The Judicial Council of California's Handbook for Conservators explains that conservatees maintain the right to have their wishes considered, and they are still entitled to basic human rights to take part in their life decisions. And from what I can tell, this arrangement is meant to keep people with these impairments from inadvertently hurting themselves with their choices, but not to keep anyone from living a normal life. Conservatorships are also not the first step for taking care of people. They're meant to be seen as the absolute last resort to aid those with severe cognitive impairment or developmental disabilities. In other words, Britney Spears isn't at all the typical person that would fall under a conservatorship by these guidelines. As you can imagine, there are quite a few ways that this can go wrong already. Yes, there's the aspect of someone abusing using this role, but there are other less malicious problems too. For one, these court appointed conservators lack any sort of training. After all, they're often family members that want the best for their relatives. This doesn't mean these conservators are professional caretakers, financial planners, or experts in any of the roles they now have to take on. What if the role proves too much for them? What if they're poor at managing their relatives' money? There's a lot that can go wrong. Richard Eisenberg interviewed T.S. Liam, a business professor at Diablo Valley College and author of The Con Game, A Failure of Trust, about conservatorships for a Forbes article back in 2015. In it, Lamb argues that their book is meant to shine a spotlight on elder abuse. And while conservatorships can be a necessity, their execution needs improvement. She also says it should be considered the most restrictive form of court intervention as they can strip people of rights and the system simply isn't well-regulated and controlled enough. She stated, most of the time, these individuals do incredible loving, caring, compassionate jobs for the relatives or friends. But the problem is they may be overwhelmed or undertrained. One survey found that fewer than 20% of courts gave conservators and guardians instructions on carrying out their duties and legal responsibilities. Plus, as you can imagine, when the abuse does take place, it's often underreported as many of these conservatees can't speak up for themselves. Now, in Brittany's case, her father was her conservator, and while family members may take on this role, there are also professional conservators. This should theoretically be safer and reduce the chance that someone will have to depend on an inexperienced family member, right? That way, there's no family fights over grandma or grandpa's care, that sort of thing. However, there are disgusting human beings that get into the conservatorship business to take advantage of those that can't fight back. Let's discuss when this system goes horribly wrong. One of the most interesting cases I found that relates to this specific type of conservatorship abuse actually dates back to the 1930s, and it was discussed at length in a 2021 article on Slate. The article explains how Will Clark Jr., the son of an exorbitantly wealthy man, had a relationship with a man named Harrison Post. Harrison had been ill. He told some people he had a stroke or a nervous breakdown. One doctor said he had a lesion in his brain. It's not entirely clear what was going on. But Clark, having the family wealth to do so, set up a massive trust for him. Then in 1934, Clark suddenly passed away and Harrison's sister, Gladys, wanting to gain access to her brother's funds, petitioned a court to have him declared incompetent. Because of his various illnesses, she was able to do so and Gladys and her husband, Charles Crooks, and yep, that's his actual name, were able to start draining him dry. Harrison later said that during this time, he was medicated against his will and physically restrained, essentially made into his sister's prisoner. 
By the time Harrison was declared competent a few years later, he had virtually nothing left. The whole story is so fascinating and I can't do it justice unless I devote a massive portion of this episode to it. But I think it's crucial to illustrate the point that sometimes by the time someone can get out of an abusive conservatorship, it might be too late. One of my sources, the Center for Elders and Courts gave some examples of this conservatorship abuse of everyday people in various states. In Texas 2016, the largest fine ever issued by the Guardianship Commission took place after Eric Watts sold off pieces of his conservatee's estate. He apparently kept the proceeds for himself and stopped paying for the conservatee's nursing home bills. Eventually, the Guardianship Certification Board ordered him to pay back $17,000 in past due bills and he lost his guardianship license. His wife and professional conservator, Sarah, lost her business and it was revealed that she had failed to submit the paperwork for her clients. Some lost their social security and Medicaid because of her actions and a $25,500 fine, $500 each for 51 clients was levied against her. In another case, the owner of a guardianship company, Safe Haven, Judith Widener, and her business bank's account were suspended. It was discovered that she'd stolen over $25,000 from her conservatees. Judith was ordered to pay it all back in restitution, write apology letters to her victims, and spend 180 days in prison. Around the same time this case took place, another professional conservator, Patience Bristol, was found to have stolen over $200,000 from clients. She had to pay back $160,000 and was sentenced to three to eight years in prison. Frustratingly, although conservatorships can be used to take advantage of older people, it gets way worse than that. Like many other topics we've discussed before, conservatorship abuse also negatively affects people of color and has historically, and even recently, been used as a way to take control of their assets. According to PRISM reports, large oil and gas reserves were found among a variety of Native American nations in the early 1900s. Similarly to Kerry, these Native Americans were declared incompetent so that lawyers could appoint themselves as the guardians of Native Americans with these properties. According to my source, courts declared Native Americans to be incompetent in most cases where oil was found on their land and newly appointed conservators eagerly availed themselves with new wealth while depriving their wards of financial control and a basic standard of living. The conservation goes into this in even more detail in their article and explaining how multiple attorneys or other conservators would take money and land from native members for their own personal expenses and investments too. They were essentially stealing in the same manner we discussed in the last chapter, but the native American people had no recourse. Money Bear described as a quote, young, shrewd, full blood Creek woman was a victim of these tactics. She ran a farm and saved enough money to buy a truck and livestock with some left over to save. However, the moment oil was discovered on her land, the court became interested and basically decided that money as a Native American was incompetent and needed a guardian. This guardian then appointed a co-guardian and retained a lawyer who deducted so many monthly fees from Money Bear that her savings were entirely depleted. As she watched her hard earned money drain away, she was unable to do anything about it and make any decisions due to her alleged incompetency. This may sound like a lot of ancient history that doesn't happen anymore, but it's truly not. In 2019, a panel discussion called the California Landscape Confronting the Conservatorship Crisis took place. As this video is about an hour and a half long, I can't possibly hit every single point that this panel did, though it will be in my sources below. However, one of the moments I find most striking was one panelist who summarized her experience of the process of conservatorship. She claims that her mother was a caretaker for her brother, Martin, who is nonverbal. Anne's mother was concerned about what would happen when she passed away. And in 2011, her family hired attorneys to aid in this. A professional conservator was appointed and to Anne's shock and horror, Martin was isolated from his family. Her mother, whose primary language was Vietnamese, was denied access through a certified interpreter because there wasn't one available at the time, even though they are legally required by the constitution to provide one. Martin was denied access to expert specialists because the conservator didn't believe it was necessary. And when cuts and bruises started appearing on Martin, Anne claims that no one would help us bring Martin to safety. Even when Anne's mother did pass away, the court seemed to be cruel and uncaring to them. Anne asked if the court could enforce the opportunity for her brother to pay respects at the time of their mother's funeral. The court asked Anne if she could delay her mother's burial instead because the conservator wasn't available to approve the request at the time. The panel also discussed how elderly people of color living in cities experiencing gentrification have had their homes seized using conservatorship laws. While the panel does focus on California, this is a nationwide problem. One conservatorship act in Pennsylvania is only 12 years old known as the Abandoned and Blighted Property Conservatorship Act. It allows someone to take over empty buildings that might drag down the value of a neighborhood. This can be fantastic in some cases when community groups improve the blighted properties, but most of the cases are filed by landlords and other private developers that seem determined to get a property labeled as such so they can take it for themselves. 
And for elderly folks that may have trouble maintaining their home, this leaves them at severe risk. Rick Schwartz, executive director of the nonprofit Bloomfield Garfield Corp said the following about the matter to public source. I would say that conservatorship has done good if it has helped to fill vacant properties that were just sitting out there abandoned. But whereas his organization tries to transform vacant properties into affordable housing, he's concerned that conservators may convert the property into an upscale home that begins to redefine the housing market in Garfield. In other words, conservatorship could be used as a tool of gentrification. If gentrification were to sweep over Garfield as the result of conservatorships or other tools of private developers, then over the next half a century, Garfield's diversity will be whittled down little by little and it will become another Lawrenceville. As we've seen with many questionable systems, they often disproportionately affect people of color. Not only can this leave someone at risk of losing their home, but when conservatorships are about medical care, it can be far more serious and life-threatening. NASCA, the National Association to Stop Guardian Abuse, posted a heartbreaking story about this on their website a few years ago, back in 2018. According to the Post, Catherine Carter was doing well in a rehabilitation center. She had been there from about September to December, 2017. Towards the end of that year, a conservator of the Alameda Probate Court sent her to a board and care facility. The conservator claimed the location was culturally appropriate, citing that Mrs. Carter is African-American, despite Carter's own doctor and family requesting she be sent to a more skilled facility. As a result of the conservator's decisions, Catherine's chronic kidney dysfunction was not addressed. Her family tried to request that Catherine be placed on a low sodium diet and speak to her doctor after her ankles swelled and she developed a blood clot on her left leg. But the conservator told them there wasn't an immediate need or ignored them entirely. According to the post, the last straw for Catherine's family was when she had a blood pressure over 200 and she was dehydrated. Once again, the conservator said she didn't need to be removed from the facility where she was located. Catherine's husband, Creedel, understandably had enough and removed her from the facility himself without the conservator's approval. Charges were actually brought against Creedel for doing this, but thankfully the judge saw reason and threw those out. Not only is it disgusting that this conservator said a facility was more culturally appropriate when said facility clearly couldn't take care of Catherine the way she needed, but I find it really upsetting that charges were even brought against Creedal in the first place. What about the family having any say? Their justified wishes were so frequently ignored and if she hadn't been removed, it seems possible and even likely that Catherine would have passed away needlessly. I hate to think how many people have been harmed this way because they don't have a family that can bust them out of a horrible facility and go against a conservatorship's wishes. Of course, I want to say that not all conservatorships are horrible or all judges or conservators are cold and heartless. However, when this results of the system are called jail-like with a lack of oversight, it's clear that this goes pretty beyond just a few corrupt people. It most certainly hints that the entire process is pretty broken. So how is it that this system that's meant to protect and help the vulnerable is separating them from their families and silencing them instead? Let's see when a conservatorship is established and how it can be potentially abusive and devolve. And we'll once again, and unfortunately, look to Britney Spears as that example. As I've previously said, Britney Spears' conservatorship was very different than the examples we've heard about thus far. News sources have reported that Britney was in a spiral of bizarre behavior since November, 2006, when she divorced the father of her children, Kevin Federline. In 2007, she also shaved her head and attacked a member of the paparazzi with an umbrella. She hit his car with it and the photos of her doing so have become quite infamous. Looking back at that time, it's pretty clear that Britney wasn't just unhinged and on a spiral as the media tended to portray her. This came after years of being mercilessly hounded by paparazzi, a toxic relationship and addiction. Allegedly, her bodyguards took bribes from paparazzi to allow them to get the photos they wanted, causing her to be constantly surrounded and harassed by them. She also didn't just shave her head without reason. She had asked a staff member of a hair salon to do it because her extensions were too tight, but they wouldn't. So Brittany took control herself. A combination of anxiety, the people around her taking advantage of her fame and more caused this breakdown. By the time the conservatorship was issued, some seemed to think that it was for her own good. Mercury News reported in 2008 that her father, James Spears, also known as Jamie, had teary eyes when the decision was made and that he and an attorney, Andrew Wallet, were named conservators of the estate. At the time, this article said her conservator would have the power to restrict visitors, give her round the clock security, and have access to medical records, all of which seemed like it would be beneficial at the time. Plus, this was only temporary to help Brittany get back on her feet, right? 
Well, in my opinion, and based on my sources, it seems like once someone has been declared incompetent, it's much harder to declare them competent again than it is to suggest that this is a temporary conservatorship would be you know, turned into something more permanent. Towards the end of 2018, Britney's father retained control of all her affairs, even before the temporary conservatorship was due to expire. One month later, Britney told MTV in the documentary, Britney for the Record, that she felt her routine was too controlled and she'd be liberated if she didn't have the lawyers and doctors analyzing her every day. When I tell them the way I feel, it's like they hear, but they're really not listening. It's like, it's bad, I'm sad, she said. For years, despite not having control over her own finances, Britney continued working. At one point back in 2012, her fiance, Jason Trawick, even was added as a co-conservator. He couldn't control her assets, but he was able to control her food, clothing, and medical care at the time. An attorney with no involvement in the case called it an unusual situation since you don't often see conservatees get married. It's one thing if a husband or wife becomes a conservator for a partner that may have been in an accident or had Alzheimer's or something that I could understand. But for a fiance to control another fiance's food, clothing, and medical care only three years into the relationship, that really rubs me the wrong way. Though the conservatorship wasn't a point of discussion for about a decade, Brittany advocated for herself behind closed doors. She expressed serious opposition to the conservatorship, claiming that it restricted everything from whom she dated to the color of her kitchen cabinets, according to the New York Times. Back in 2016, she wrote it was an oppressive and controlling tool against her and told an investigator she wanted it terminated. Then in 2019, she said she was being forced to continue performing on and to stay at mental health care facilities, all while other people benefited from her career. After all, her father was approved by the court to receive a percentage of Britney's deals, like her number one album, her guest starring on national television and all her shows across the world. And from the start, Jamie had a conflict of interest here and quite a serious one. He received a percentage of her income as well as a relatively small $16,000 salary as a conservator, meaning he would naturally want to see Britney perform. Yet as a conservator, it's supposed to be his job to ensure she's taken care of and her wishes are heard and respected. And those two things just don't match. Frankly, I think it's seriously disgusting that the court allowed him to have this percentage, creating this conflict of interest in the first place. After all, even if he only got about 3% of her femme fatale tour in 2011, 3% of hundreds of millions is still millions. All the while, much of this wasn't shared with the public. Back in 2016, the New York Times reported that Britney was presented as fully in control on stage, but she wasn't giving the right to stand on her own. They also addressed the point that Britney isn't at all the usual client for a conservatorship and that the system in California itself was troubled for decades, though it has undergone reforms in recent years that were designed to further protect the old and infirm people who are its typical clients. Thankfully, things did start to change for Britney as well. It sure took long enough. Wallet, the lawyer and co-conservator resigned from his role. Her father, Jamie, relinquished his control as conservator to Britney's caretaker, Jody Montgomery, after he became ill. Britney's attorney also filed a petition that he strongly opposed Jamie's returning role as sole conservator when he felt better. Judge Penny denied the request that Jamie be removed entirely, but did allow for Jamie to have split his financial control with a firm known as Bessemer Trust. Bessemer was chosen by Britney's lawyer, but again, this didn't last though, as in 2021, Jamie became her sole conservator once again. At this point though, Britney's court appointed lawyer since 2008 had resigned and Britney's mother, Lynn, petitioned that Britney be allowed to choose her own attorney. And thankfully she was permitted to do so and chose Matthew Rosengart to advocate for her. Though things were stagnant for many years, by this point, the case was moving fast. The New York Times documentary framing Britney Spears was released that year, bringing more attention to the issue and Britney herself began speaking publicly for the first time about what happened. She also testified that she'd been drugged, forced to perform against her will and prevented from having more children, stating that she wouldn't perform again so long as her father had control of her career. This prompted her father to state that he would step down when the time is right, though he was ultimately suspended as conservator in September, 2021. The very next month, Britney supporters everywhere rejoiced as finally her conservatorship ended. Britney stated that she was celebrating her freedom and thanked her lawyer for his work on her case. Of course, this is an overview. If you wanna see all the court documents and breaking news related to this case, freebritney.net has all of those things compiled very neatly and nicely on their website. While Britney is finally free, the case is not completely over as she and Matthew Rosengart are attempting to hold her father accountable for his heinous actions. And surprising to no one, Jamie still doesn't seem to care or realize the gravity of the situation because in December, 2021, he petitioned Britney's estate to cover all of his legal expenses. Yeah, Jamie, the allegedly abusive father who kept his daughter in a conservatorship for 13 years is asking her to cover his legal costs. 
Rosengart called it shameful and made note that Jamie reaped many millions of dollars from Britney already, and he has some nerve asking for another penny. Unfortunately, there are other players in this as well, like someone named Louise Taylor. According to the New York Times, accounts for Britney were opened at an obscure Tennessee firm, Stonebridge Wealth Management, that Miss Taylor co-founded and co-owned. Taylor herself seemed to benefit from this arrangement, and she was also a business manager icon that worked with the likes of Aerosmith, Gwen Stefani, and Jennifer Lopez. Once again, being someone who profits from Britney's work, yet is involved with her conservatorship in any capacity, reeks of self-interest. Plus, Jamie himself actually borrowed $40,000 from this firm in the past, though he did pay it back, which led critics to once again point out this conflict of interest. Recently, allegations have begun spreading that Taylor was even involved in the conservatorship from the onset and had once tried to even conserve Lindsay Lohan, making this whole thing even more convoluted and questionable. I also hate to think what might've happened if Britney's court appointed lawyer had not resigned. Perhaps resigning was the best thing he could have done for her. Would she have been able to get her own lawyer without this act happening? How long would the process have taken? It's just truly ridiculous how long this has lasted in the first place. Now, before we continue on to the next section to talk about changes and what is happening in the conservatorship world and how people are gonna try and prevent things that happen to Britney Spears from happening to anyone else, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. If you're anything like me, planning is an absolute necessity just to make it through the day. And when I'm saying planning, I'm planning everything. Everything's written down on whiteboards. I know what I'm doing, what I'm eating, and I know probably weeks in advance. That's why I really love HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients to your door every single week, or if you don't wanna do every single week, they can do it whenever it works for your schedule, which is great for someone like me. You can pick your favorites from 50 different weekly options and skip weeks when you need to, change your delivery date or update your preferences all within the HelloFresh app, which is seriously the easiest thing in the world to use. And HelloFresh's chefs really know how to diversify the menu with seasonal recipes like salmon limon and pasta primavera. And HelloFresh even has fit and wholesome recipes for satisfying and nutritious meals that you can feel good about with six recipes per week to choose from, including low calorie and carb conscious options too. So make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash casket16 and use code casket16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Online shopping isn't slowing down anytime soon. So is your business ready to keep up the pace? Well, with ShipStation, you'll never have to worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. You can save time by funneling your orders into one simple interface. It doesn't matter if you're using Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or your own website, from anywhere, even from your phone. And ShipStation works with every carrier, so you can find the best fit for you. And this is kind of awesome. You are going to get the same types of discounted rates that are usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies. And that's why ShipStation is already trusted by over 100,000 other e-commerce sellers. It's easy to keep track of orders, you can find the best shipping carrier, and you can automate just about any shipping task with just a few clicks. So if you have a small business, if you just need to ship out a ton of mail from time to time or whatever you're doing, make it easier with ShipStation. Use my offer code casket to get a 60 day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in the word casket. ShipStation, make ship happen. So what does this mean for everyone else stuck in conservatorships? After all, it took over 13 years before Britney was able to gain her freedom and that's with her wealth and resources. For someone that can't afford an inexperienced attorney, what options do they have? Well, thankfully, things do seem to be changing slowly but surely. Last year, Oregon passed a law that requires legal assistance for anyone placed under a guardian, and California has passed a law increasing scrutiny of conservatorship abuse. AP News said that Britney's case has since put a spotlight on efforts to rein in conservators and remarked that in New Jersey in 2021 has cracked down on the circle of people who could petition for someone to be placed under a guardian. New Mexico has also created an independent review procedure for oversight purposes, which includes checking bank records and lawmakers have begun acknowledging just how broken the system has become. AP News reports, the system is failing people from every walk of life, whether they are a global superstar whose struggles unfortunately play out in public or a family unsure of how to take care of an elderly parent, said State Assemblyman Evan Lowe, a Democrat who introduced the bill after watching the recent documentary, Controlling Britney Spears. New Jersey Assemblywoman Carol Murphy also admitted how alarmingly easy it is for someone to petition for conservatorship without necessary changes. Let's say some wealthy woman is worth millions and millions and their nephew is going around saying she's not all there and she needs to be taken care of. 
Well, under the current law, you can do that, she said. It needs to be harder for family members that could have ulterior motives to apply for these incredibly restrictive conservatorships. That's not to say that family members should not be able to get their loved ones help by any means, but the present system in place makes it too easy for bad actors to succeed while the vulnerable's voices are suppressed. What happened to Britney is appalling and it should have never happened in the first place. At least now that it's out in the open and if you look up what conservatorship abuse is, there is so, so many of the search results available and they're recent and in the wake of Britney Spears' revelations, they're finally getting the light and attention they deserve. The Des Moines Register has also called on Iowa to start looking at their laws as over 23,000 Iowans fall under the conservatorship or guardianship status. Older cases like Harrison's have begun making headlines. Of course, this doesn't mean that every single conservator has bad intentions and that all conservatorships are abusive. Conservatorships can work when the conservatee's wishes are considered. They're charged reasonable amounts and the conservator genuinely has their best interest at heart. I'm sure that these cases do happen. I'd like to hope and believe that they're even more frequent than the negative ones. But please know that the point of today's episode is not to make you hate conservators, but to recognize just how easy it is for those that want to prey on the vulnerable to thrive. Now that we've seen the ugly, dark side of conservatorships, it's time to call for reform. Hopefully other states will follow suit and start to repair this damage system. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me today. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 